I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, and delighted to be working here rather than where I last worked, wherever that was, somewhere in the U.S. Uh, capital. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special uh, Wilson Center event. Uh, it has been, to quote our president, a huge day in the nation's capital, uh, both in Congress and at the Wilson Center. Uh, our keynote speaker is welcome to comment if he wishes on the other event, but I just want to say that uh, uh, at 1 p.m. today, we kicked off a week-long defeating disinformation workshop where lawmakers from Brazil, Canada, France, Mexico, and the U.K. are convening to discuss cross-border solutions to disinformation. Welcome to our attendees all in the front rows from all of those places, uh, including uh, Leah Gabrielle, Special Envoy uh, of the U.S. State Department's Global Engagement Center, as well as our several alums of our cyber and AI labs uh, for congressional staffers. I'm sure you know about this, uh, Senator Warner, but we have trained a thousand of the best and brightest Capitol Hill staffers on topics including cybersecurity, uh, artificial intelligence, and foreign policy. And they are very smart, and they are now uh, friends of each other, which is a very good start. So thank you to everyone in our Science and Technology uh, Innovation Program for your work putting this together, especially the big boss, Nina Jankowitz, our disinformation fellow and ringleader, and also to the director of the whole program, um, an indispensable part of my brain, uh, Meg King. Uh, I, let, me, let me start this way. I've been around a while. And I've seen the telltale signs of emerging crises. In 1999 to 2000, I served on the National Commission on Terrorism. And it was very clear that there could be a catastrophic attack on U.S. soil, t catastrophic terrorist attack on U.S. soil. No one was listening. This time, the markers are clear. Governments around the world have experienced the dangers of disinformation. In response, Congress has grilled the leaders of Facebook, Google, and Twitter in public hearings, but not much has happened yet uh, in the way of public policy. Meanwhile, far more has happened outside the United States. Europe's general data protection regulation, France's fake news law, and Brazil's internet governance law have been in effect for years and have been debated far for much longer. These laws aren't perfect, but they are proof that the rest of the world isn't waiting to take on this dire threat. So, segue to someone who has been listening. Uh, we have been talking about Mark Warner's visit for months. In fact, he and I talked about it last summer. Uh, and he said, I'm coming, I'm coming, I really want to come. And boy, did he pick the right day for this visit. <laughs> uh, he uh, uh, knows a lot about the technology that's powering disinformation. Before he was elected to the Senate in 2008 and before serving as Virginia governor from 2002 to 2006, he was an entrepreneur in the telecom industry and an investor in hundreds of tech startups. Two years ago, Senator Warner, who is now also vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, published a white paper that laid out 20 policy proposals for regulating social media and tech firms confronting disinformation, protecting user data, and ensuring competition. One of the things uh, I most applaud him for, in addition to writing brilliant white papers, is his bipartisanship. Got to say that, uh, especially today. Uh, one of the things he did uh, earlier in his Senate term is to team up with former Senator Saxby Chambliss, who was my buddy when he served in the House, to create the Gang of Six, which attempted a grand compromise on something we never talk enough about, uh, the nation's debt and deficits. He also, uh, when Saxby chaired the Intel Committee, was the vice chairman, and their bipartisanship continued, and it continues now when Richard Burr, uh, um, uh, senator from North Carolina, is the chairman of the committee. Bipartisanship is almost extinct in Congress, but it is alive and well at the Wilson Center. And so it is with great pleasure to introduce an Intel buddy and a wonderful, creative, thoughtful, problem-solving senator, Senator Mark Warner. That's what I think. 
Well, thank you, Jane. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, although I do have to put a little bit of a caveat on that. Um, Saxby and I did take on the issue of our nation's debt and deficit. We formed the Gang of Six. Of course, I always make mention of the fact that I work at the only place in America where being a gang member is a good thing. Um, and when we were working on that, our nation's debt was $17 trillion. Today it's $24 trillion. So I'm not sure we were completely that, uh, that successful. I, I do want to, again, thank Jane. I want to thank the Wilson Center um, for, one, your friendship, two, for having me back on a, a variety of occasions um, to talk about critically important issues. And this issue of disinformation is one which um, I'm going to go through in, at some length today. I also apologize for being a few minutes um, late uh, beyond what was just going on on the Hill, where I was casting my votes um, uh, in a fairly, obviously, historic day. Um, but I had a moment to spend with my friend Damian Collins, who's been really from the UK, uh, the leader on this issue of misinformation and disinformation. And I would simply point out the last time, Damien and I have talked a couple times, but the last time we were literally together in person, um, we were at a joint session, was the very day then when President Trump and President Putin were together in Helsinki, and President Trump basically um, undermined the whole in American intelligence community when he said, you know, I stand with Putin rather than with the American intelligence community. So now here we are a year later and we're together again today and we took a vote on impeachment. So I'm not sure for those who are predicting future political events, we ought to make sure Collins and Warner don't hook up anytime again in, in, in the near future. Um, this, inf this subject of, of disinformation uh, in, in many ways, um, the approach and efforts around disinformation in many ways were some of the spurring efforts that that um, uh, that led to the impeachment process we just went through uh, the idea of foreign nations intervening in our elections in ways um, that we probably could not have predicted a decade ago although perhaps we should have um, we see this notion uh, and and the challenge it poses uh, as recently as um, Tuesday night, when we see the chaos uh, that's come forward out of the, um, what, the circumstances in the Iowa primary or the Iowa caucuses. Uh, the good news is that, that there is no indication that we have seen or our Department of Homeland Security has seen that, that the um, Iowa caucus uh, mix-up uh, had anything to do with foreign intervention. Um, it was just plain old screw-ups on the part of the Democrats in Iowa, something that we've done in the past. Um, but what we've seen in the aftermath is an enormous flush of information as the Internet has been awash with theories uh, and, and most of them um, bearing no relationship to truth about what happened in Iowa. And matter of fact, um, you know, we should have been better, obviously better prepared. The, uh, there's lots of, um, there'll be lots of after action reports about how we would have made sure that the system should have been tested um, on the front end. But the notion of how when an event like this happens and there's not an official response immediately, that void is immediately filled with information. And the truth, the validity, the honesty of that information, we still do not yet know. And it will probably take us some time as the kind of host of, frankly, wacky theories about what happened in Iowa. We don't know whether that was domestic generated or whether it was foreign generated. But the one thing we absolutely do know is that foreign actors, whether it be Russia, China, Iran, others, will not hesitate at all to latch on to any kind of event uh, in, a, in order to spread domestic discord and, frankly, to distract from our elections. Anything 
a foreign entity can do to undermine Americans' faith in our electoral process, they count as a win. And unfortunately, what happened uh, on Tuesday night and into Wednesday and now into Thursday uh, uh, in Iowa um, counts as, as a win in terms of undermining our country's um, and individual voters' confidence in our system. So I think we've got to be vigilant in defending against direct foreign interference. But we must be also on guard against opportunistic efforts to use the screw-ups like what happened in Iowa to undermine confidence in our democracy and erode our civil discourse. It is the need to preserve that discourse and firm up confidence in our system that I want to talk to you about today. Um, from the time our Founding fathers thought about that idea of free expression. Um, a thoughtful public discourse has been critical to the whole experiment of American democracy. But unfortunately, like so many of our institutions in 2020, that discourse is under assault. It's under assault from dark money. It's under assault from Russian trolls and bots. It's under assault from domestic extremists who exploit social media. In each of these cases, the very openness and diversity uh, that we pride ourselves on is actually used as a way in to our system, and that very openness is used as a way to attack us. And obviously, as we see, the level of confidence in our institutions erode at a dramatic basis. Uh, these efforts, domestic and foreign alike, are fairly successful. Now, I think we need to step back and, and, and think for a little bit about uh, how we got here. And let me acknowledge at the front end, my views on a lot of these topics have, have changed dramatically. Uh, Jane mentioned I was um, in the telecom business in the early 80s. I started a cell phone company called Nextel. I, it means that I am the only politician that says, even when I'm speaking, leave your cell phones on. Doesn't bother me at all. Matter of fact, uh, um, but I think what happened, if we go back to the 80s, the 90s, and even the 2000s. I think most all of us were probably, in, and I would argue both in the public sector and the private sector, and I would think in, in, with many of my colleagues around the world, we were perhaps too overly techno-optimists. We thought each new technology innovation was going to bring great new discoveries, build huge new communities, empower people in ways that we'd never seen. And then when we saw the founders, particularly of some of the large platform companies, you know, at least make statements that we will only do good, uh, we all kind of bought their line. And for a long time, I think we thought all of these efforts were inherently democratizing and inherently adding to the dialogue. Um, what I think we didn't realize, and there's plenty of good things that have come out of Facebook and Google and Twitter and other platforms. But what we didn't fully appreciate with all that upside, there's very few times where you're going to have massive innovation that only falls on one side of the ledger in terms of good or bad. We saw all the good, but it really has taken us a long, long time to understand with that good comes the counter, a dark underbelly. And only in the last few years have we seen that dark underbelly and some of the, some of the applications come out of that. Uh, one of the things I was talking with Damien about uh, before, before we came in, um, we built that kind of techno-optimism into some of the rules, at least in terms of how the platform companies were going to operate in, in this country. We created something back in the late 90s called the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act um, that maybe in the late 90s made some sense. We thought about the fact that these new startup enterprises should maybe have no responsibility for any of the content that they might transport, that they are in effect were dumb pipes a la telecom companies, and they bore no responsibility. Um, maybe that made sense at that point. But when 65% of Americans get some or all their news from Facebook and Google, news that is curated by these platforms, I'm not sure that kind of blanket exemption makes the same kind of sense. I think about as well uh, 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 positions that I used to have in the late 80s, early 90s, and even into the 2000s, 
where I thought if we simply welcome China more into the world economy, bring them in uh, to the WTO, more embracing, more trade, that that would simply, again, lead to a broader, more democratized world. Again, I think history has proven that probably has not proven to be the case. We've seen the color revolution sweep across Europe and across other parts of the world. Uh, and again, we thought technology was going to bring about an ability for people to communicate in ways that we'd not seen before. Again, that was true until those very same technologies, particularly led by a country like China, which has shown how you can use these technologies to monitor your people in levels and ways that would make Orwell blush, has frankly become the new reality. So today, I think we need to rethink this perspective. Now, that doesn't mean we need to become Luddites. It doesn't need, mean that we need to fear technology on a going forward basis. But I do think we need to develop a new set of both foreign and domestic tech policies that are based in, I'm not saying necessarily a more pessimistic, but at least a more realistic expectation of both the good and the bad that comes out of technology and the internet. Now again, this is a somewhat surprising place for me to be as someone who frankly got rich off of some of these technologies, who was a huge advocate for bringing China into the WTO, someone that felt that these were all going to be tools that were going to lead to this greater democratization. Um, in many ways, I still fall into this category in Congress as being the tech guy. Now, in full candor, and I can say this since most of my colleagues are still up on the Hill, I was very tech savvy. I was as knowledgeable as most anybody in the tech field circa 2001 when I became governor of Virginia. <laughs> the problem is the fact that I was tech savvy circa 2001 still puts me a decade ahead of most of my Senate <laughs> colleagues. Uh, or more. Um, so now that we've seen some of the ways that this technology that can both empower but also can be misused, um, how do, we, how do we think about this? Um, in many ways, this awareness spread across or at least our Congress when we saw the ramifications of R Russia's attack on our democracy uh, back in 2016. Um, we know now the United States faces serious threats in the cyber domain, both from state and non-state actors. Not to th mention the actual threat that I think is as great as direct attacks that comes from misinformation from not only Russia, but now a host of other countries that have seen their playbook. I, again, I made this comment with Damien before. Um, one of the reasons why we know Russia and others will be back, if you add up all that Russia spent interfering in our elections in the 2016, if you add up all Russia spent in the Brexit vote, if you add up all they spent when they were so obvious in the French presidential elections uh, when Macron was elected, Macron was elected, and you add that all together, those three interventions, it's less than the cost of one new F-35 airplane. Think about that for a moment. You know, in a country like ours where we're spending now close to $800 billion a year, where no competing nation can spend dollar for dollar what we're spending, what better opportunity than to think in an asymmetric way, particularly when sometimes you can hide where this originates from, that misinformation, disinformation will become a tool in any country's arsenal on a going forward basis. So what do we do? Um, I think we're starting to finally, and I say again, Finally, because unfortunately America is lagging compared to our European and, and other American uh, countries around, around our hemisphere and for that matter around the world, but we are finally starting to have some long overdue conversations on privacy, on data transparency, on notions around competition, and other critical issues related to social media. But we must also confront the way that domestic actors, not just foreign, but domestic actors, have used these technologies. Our position as a global leader on technology, frankly, has been weakened 
because the United States, whether it is in standard-setting bodies or other areas, has frankly retreated. Part of this is due to an unwillingness of Congress to really actually pass legislation. Part of this has come from not just this administration, but the Obama administration and the Bush administrations before that failure to fully participate in standard-setting technical, technical conferences and a whole series of other efforts. Uh, I think we frankly had a set of arrogance coming out in this nation, and for that matter in the West, I would almost argue in a post-Sputnik world, virtually every major technological innovation, if not invented in America, it might have been invented in the UK or Japan or elsewhere, but at the end of the day, America and its allies was the entity that set the rules, the protocols, the procedures, which then governed how that technology was rolled out. In many ways, being the world's biggest market, that allowed us domination. We're suddenly seeing that all up for grabs. And as somebody that's a former telecom guy, we are seeing this play out in real time in the debate on 5G, where not America or the West is setting the standards, but China is setting the standards. Where China, both through flooding the zone on the technology standard setting entities, China through its Belt and Road initiatives in terms of signing up allied states, suddenly is winning the battle. And part of the battle is not simply who's got the best current product, a la a Huawei with a $100 billion backstop funding behind it, but if you are the entity or country that is setting the rules of the road and the protocols and the procedures, we've taken that so much for granted, and China, whether it's in 5G, whether it's in AI, whether it's in quantum, hypersonics is trying to set the rules and procedures in all of these areas. And in the meantime, unfortunately, um, we in the Congress are not acting. At the meantime, the Trump administration ha has a completely haphazard approach uh, on how they approach technology. On 5G, I think they are getting it right. But on one hand, you cannot go out and call Canada a national security risk under their Section 232 tariffs and then expect Canada to stand with us as we think about 5G technology rules. This notion of alliances and allies goes well beyond direct military, but really, as we think about a 21st century world that is going to be more and more geared both on an economic and on a technology basis, those kind of alliances become um, so much more important. There are, there are encouragement, though. Uh, I'm encouraged by the actions of the, the EU. I'm encouraged by the actions of what's happening both in France and in the UK on some of the questions around content. Um, but I also think uh, that the United States, by, again, still the notion of our size, the notion of our economy, the notion that we should have policies that represent our values, need to re-engage with our allies around the world as we set tech policy on a going forward basis. Let me now spend a couple of minutes uh, about um, this question around disinformation. Um, as Vice Chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, I feel like I now have a PhD in disinformation over the last three years. Uh, we spent a, a long time looking at the Russian intervention. As Jane mentioned, I am proud of the fact that we are the last bipartisan entity that is looking at this subject. Um, compared to the competition, that's a fairly low bar to get over. Um, uh, but in many ways, what happened in 2016 caught our political parties caught our media, caught our intelligence community completely flat-footed. Um, and quite honestly, we should have seen it coming. Uh, I know we've got colleagues here from Ukraine. I mean, we didn't have to look to simply what had happened in the EU. If we had looked at the, ta the tactics that Russia had been using in the Ukraine and in the Baltic states for years prior to what happened in 2016 in America, we could have and should have been better prepared. For example, the techniques used by the Russian IRA were not new. This whole idea that you would go out and under a false name build an audience often not related to any kind of political 
ideology. You know, a lot of the Russian activity we saw uh, in, in 2016, um, there was an entity that was supporting gardening. There was an entity that was supporting cooking. There were a number of sites that were promoting football. There was a big Alabama football site. And there's a lot of University of Alabama football fans in this country. But under these false identities, you would create this following, create a series of followers, and then slowly start to seed in misinformation, disinformation. Matter of fact, one of the most uh, remarkable was within the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and again, this, this audience probably knows this, but the leading Black Lives Matter website that had the greatest number of followers was a site that did not originate in America, but originated from the IRA, from St. Petersburg, as a site trying to imitate that effort, but again, an extraordinarily successful um, effort. So whether we see audience building or expo exploitation of uh, recommended uh, algorithms or other techniques, you know, used by online fraudsters, again, we should have been aware. Um, we should have seen, again, some early warning signs for those kind of even outside the political realm, uh, realm uh, as we think about some of the gamers with the, um, the Gamergate in 2014. That was where there was a concerted harassment campaign waged against women in the video gaming industry. Gamergate foreshadowed how actors, how bad actors, could use a variety of online platforms to spread conspiracy theories and weaponize Facebook groups and other seemingly innocuous communities online. We also, again, as I mentioned already, missed the warning signs on the international context, um, what Russia had done in the Ukraine, in the Baltics, in other nations around the world. Um, we should have been better aware. So now I fear that we've entered into a new area, both of nation-state conflict, um, where nation-states will spend less on traditional military hardware and more on cyber and misinformation and disinformation techniques. And why? Because it's effective and it's cheap. And oftentimes you can do it without, since we've not set any international standards on attribution, you can do it, if you care to, and hide your hands. We've, also, we've already seen this Russian playbook expand to other nations as social media disinformation has been used by the Burmese military to uh, promote uh, ethnic cleansing with the Rohingya. We've seen it in China using it to attack pro-democracy groups in Hong Kong and meddle recently in Taiwan's elections. We've seen it in the Philippines in a much more aggressive way to silence critics. We've seen it in Africa, in, in the Sudan, and elsewhere. And what's so amazing is oftentimes these adversaries aren't necessarily using the most cutting-edge, sophisticated tools. They don't have to. They're simply using old techniques like phishing, fake accounts, and other techniques that, frankly, the rest of the world's moved way past, but they can still use them because they're effective. And um, where do we go from here? So I think as we think about a society that is becoming more and more dependent on technology products and networks, Yet the level of security and integrity we expect, we accept in commercial technology products is shockingly low. One of the things that I've been working on for four years that just makes me crazy is Internet of Things. We all know how many devices we're going to be purchasing. The United States government is literally buying millions of IoT-connected devices each year. The expectation is we'll be up to 25 or 30 billion devices by about the year 2022. In the United States, and I'm not sure whether in, in the EU or elsewhere, we don't even have basic minimum security standards for all those IoT connected devices. So we're still buying devices with embedded passcodes, with no ability to be patched, with no even basic de minimis security. You talk about stupidity on steroids, that is a prime example of where we still are way behind where we should be. We also have to think about this on an international basis. While some in the private sector have begun to grapple with these challenges, much more needs to be done. And obviously Congress has not gotten its act together. Because it's not enough to simply improve our security and integrity of our own infrastructure, computer systems, and data. We've got to work in a coordinated way uh, to deal with adversaries and bad actors. And I think we have to do that in an international basis to start setting standards around attribution, 
start setting standards around what is going to be viewed as acceptable behavior and what is not. There was an effort 20 plus years ago to think about international standards in, in terms of cyber and the internet. Unfortunately, the United States didn't want to ha have take the leadership it, it should have at that moment in time, but we do need to re re reinforce and restart those, um, restart those efforts. Uh, we need to build, I think, international support for rules that address the Internet's potential for censorship and repression. We must present our own alternatives that explicitly embrace a free and open Internet. And we need that responsibility to not only extend to the government, but we've got to find a way to make sure this responsibility extends to the private sector as well. The truth is, Western companies who help authoritarian regimes and they're some of the biggest name companies that around who help authoritarian regimes build censored apps or walled garden versions of the Internet are just as much of a threat, no matter how much they may be being paid for, paid by China to do that, as some of the bad actors here at home. Um, and we need to start by realizing the status quo just isn't working. For over two decades, the U.S. has maintained and promoted a completely hands-off approach to Internet governance. And so, today, the large platforms, um, and again, Damien and I were talking a little bit, make a half-hearted, and I would say good-faith effort to say around what should be the basic um, requirements about political disclosure in advertising, uh, the Honest Ads Act. Yet the fact that we've not been able to pass legislation means that this self-policing effort that is run by the platforms, frankly, is not getting the job done. It's not getting the job done now as we move into full campaign season in this country and as we've seen, you know, particularly with our European friends as their campaigns move on as well. Um, somehow we've said, you know, if we make any rules of the roads or tweaks, we would end up stifling innovation. I don't buy that. I don't buy as well that we can simply have this, this notion from the big platforms, trust us, we're good guys, we're only going to do good. Even if that is their intent, and I don't question some of the founders' intent, the ability to actually have that executed without some level of governmental regulation, I think, is really missing. Um, so... I had a lot more, you know, in this formal speech, but let me just, you know, let me just bring this to a close and kind of tell you what I really think. Um, <laughs> so here's where I think uh, what we need, to, we need to grapple with. It is time for us to rethink Section 230. When we've seen this used as a shield against malicious behavior, when we've seen it used as a shield, for example, for someone who had a relationship, this famous case in this country around Grindr, where someone was constantly harassed after someone gave away uh, their ex's personal information and the individual ha received a level of harassment that should be illegal under any circumstances, but the platform said Section 230 prevents us. When we think about uh, a, a company like Facebook that says, we may take down some content, but anybody that claims that they are a political candidate can lie with impunity. That is not going to lead to a better or more fulsome democracy. We need your ideas. Uh, the first place I think we will move uh, in the United States will be in privacy legislation. But privacy, and with all due respects to GDPR and what's happened in California, is necessary but not sufficient. We need data portability. We need data interoperability. We need, as consumers, to know what data is collected about us and how much it's worth. We need to experiment with new ideas about can we think about delegating the care of our data to a third party, delegability, an idea that is starting to run around, maybe some good, maybe some bad, but we ought to think through this. We need to make sure, again, bipartisan legislation I've got that would prevent the kind of manipulative dark patterns where so often consumers are lured into giving up information that they don't know. This is the, you know, in, in kind of real people speak, this is where you can only click I agree and you can never find the unsubscribe button. 
the amount of money the platform spent on trying to use ways to manipulate us into giving up information that we don't know uh, is, is, uh, is tremendous. And we need to recognize that so many of these tools, uh, and I, I point again particularly to China, where we have seen China in collaboration with their great tech, tech companies, the Alibabas, the Badus, the Tencents, and unfortunately sometimes with assist from companies like Google, build levels of social monitoring and personal surveillance that the world has never seen before. What will be the international response to that? Can we have built a new coalition of the willing that says we embrace new technology, but we realize with this new technology comes rights and responsibilities? I think actually in many ways the tech companies are starting to wake up that by, you know, kind of slow rolling the American Congress, um, which is a fairly easy thing to do in terms of our effectiveness these days, all they're doing is raising the bar because as our friends in Europe or our friends in California or states around the country continue to put some of these new rules and regulations in place, all they're doing is raising the floor to where when we do act, um, the regulations, I think, will be more, more fulsome. But we cannot do this alone. We desperately need to re think about this international coalition. We need to set these international norms. Uh, I think the kind of uh, conversations that you're going to have here, uh, Jane, is an enormously important step, in, uh, right step in that direction. Please count me in as someone, as an ally, as someone that needs to learn from you all. Uh, together we can make this happen. Uh, and the failure to do so leaves us um, at all our peril if we want a democracy, an internet, an openness of exchange where we can actually trust uh, who we're hearing from, how we're hearing from, and the validity of the information that helps us make policy decisions. So thank you all so much for my opportunity to be here. And again, beware if Damian Collins and Mark Warner reappear at any time soon. Uh -huh. Thank you all very much. Okay. I'll stay for a few minutes, okay. yeah. Um, uh, what? Yeah. You're staying. You're you're here. You are. Staying means here. Yeah, I mean you're still performing very yes, very briefly. Better than going to a fundraiser. So, I, in fact, I was going to offer you asylum at the Wilson Center if you uh, would like it. But let me just ask you a, a few questions, and we'll take one from the audience. Sure. Real fast. Okay. So, <laughs> while you were talking, I was thinking about my deathless prose that goes like this: Politicians are analog, and the problems are digital. And I wonder, this is a question about the sophistication of your colleagues. Uh, you were making some gentle jokes. But seriously, how many people in Congress right now, you don't have to name names, we don't have to go there, could possibly cover the material, material you just covered in this speech? And you're my friend. Um, well, I actually yeah. think there there are a growing number who are learning. I mean, it's, it's also, you know, how many people in this audience can, um, um, you know, be experts in obscure parts of tort law? You know, so people bring different experiences to the table. I do think the, go the good news on this is, for example, we've got six different pieces of legislation we've laid out. Every one of these pieces of legislation are bipartisan. There is a growing recognition that we need to act. And, and I say this, and let me be clear, um, I, I, anytime I talk about China, I want to make very clear, you know, China is a great nation. Um, I, I think you have to be very clear that I am not anti-Chinese by any, by any means. I stand with the people of Hong Kong. I stand with the Uyghurs in Western China. I, I do have huge concerns with uh, President Xi Jinping and the Communist Party of China and what they're doing. Um, but on this issue around China, there is huge bipartisan agreement and a recognition that, you know, do you really want a 5G and 6G world where the, you know, not just America, but the whole world is dependent on a Huawei technology that does have backdoors, that is a security risk. 
Um, the challenge has been, though, that we in the West have not offered a viable economic alternative. And I think there is a chance here to create a coalition of the willing. So I actually think there is a growing number of members who are learning. There's a lot. There's nothing Democrat or Republican about this. Right. And on an issue, for example, particularly in terms of the security threats around China, uh, there's huge, huge bipartisan agreement. Well, it's good news. And surely the staff in Congress is getting smarter because we're training them down here on how the technology works, uh, literally on how the technology works, and then what are some policy options that could add some value, both in the public and the private sectors. Uh, but uh, just remembering my own experience, it was a little rough to find people who, who could, including me, who had subtle enough minds around this material to understand it. And well, well, you one, do. one thing, Jane, I, I, I think we need to, and I, and I don't want to sound, you know, um, lots of uh, our international friends here, but I, I think one of the things that we've not thought nearly enough about is this whole notion, it's kind of nerdy, but this whole notion about rules, protocols, standards yeah. that, you know, kind of, no matter where the the, no matter where things were invented, by again, by the size of our economy, it ended up defaulting to the West and mostly America setting those rules, protocols, and standards. And even though we didn't get it normally right, we were still a nation where rule of law governed, where there were basic notions around human rights and values that reflect, that were reflected in those standards. And I think the challenge we face, one of the major, major challenges we face as we think about the kind of transformative technology that AI can bring, that facial recognition can bring, quantum computing, which could obviously un unlock everything around encryption. We're seeing 5G and all the ramifications. You know, if you're ever going to have driverless cars, it's going to be on a 5G-related network. When we give up that leadership and the values that come with that leadership around standards, rules, protocols, that has huge, huge ramifications. And frankly, I think most of our friends around the world, even as sometimes as, as ham-handed as we are, would welcome America's reemergence in leadership in, in, in those positions. And uh, we're going to have to do it in much more concert with our allies. Uh, and that is one of my gravest concerns uh, with this administration, which has kind of a, an America-only yeah. approach uh, on issues where there is not going to be an American-only solution. So to quote from the script of Hamilton, or the I guess it's the script, we're not in the room where it happens, and increasingly we're not. And that is something that has been expressed here, and it's a big worry. I have one more question, and then we're going to take two together from, from this audience, and then you get to go back uh, to where you came from. Um, so uh, you were saying, Mark, that you have to think about rights and responsibilities together. This is a hard concept. I mean, you, a right is privacy. A responsibility is content somehow that is not uh, uh, fake news. And, and putting those together is difficult. Most people talk in terms of balance. You have to balance security with liberty. I heard this for years. Uh, I don't think balance is the right word because that's a zero sum game. That means you get more of one and less of the other. I think it's got to be a positive sum game. You have to think about rights and responsibilities uh, adding to each other. I don't know if you agree with that. I'm asking you that. And then I'm asking you, if, you, if I'm right, how, how do you get people to think like that? Let's go back to the impeachment question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, it, um, I think that notion of rights and responsibilities, how— we have had such a we, – we've had around the internet a total laissez-faire approach, which for the first decade or two worked. But we need to realize at some point when these companies have more power, and I would argue some of the platforms have as much if not more power than, again, using an American analogy, than the standard oils – had at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the idea, it's just not, it's not fair to those companies or frankly fair to their shareholders to think that their self-regulation is going to be 
uh, the only answer. So you, you are going to have to set um, uh, some rules of the road. Uh, and, I, and I think this, this concept of, of rights and responsibility, it, you know, again, there are examples that we can learn from from around the world that have got part of this balance right. Um, and chances are we're going to, we're going to um, um, you know, have to try. We probably won't get it right 100% the first, the first go round. I mean, we do have unique characteristics like our First Amendment that right. a, a, other of our neighbors don't have. So one of the areas that we've been trying to think, think through is rather than trying to get at the First Amendment right to say something stupid, crazy, wrong. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't restrict that, but you instead look at the questions around amplification. If you want to make something say something crazy, you got a right to say that. But do you really have the right to say something crazy and totally wrong, and then have it amplified a billion times? without any restrictions. So again, m may be a way to try to thread that needle and we're working through some of Good those answer. ideas. All right, two questions. One here, there's a microphone. Identify yourselves, please. Other second question, come on, come on. Oh, this is hard, wait, just hold on one second. Uh, right here, okay. Um, I'm Charlie Angus, Member of Parliament from Canada and worked with the UK on the International Grand Committee. Um, and I think, I just want to point out, in Canada, we have a very strong tradition of privacy, but since we're nice about it, we don't have any teeth in our legislation. <laughs> in 2008, Elizabeth Denham, who did amazing work in the UK, was our privacy commissioner, and she identified the Facebook breach that became the Kogan breach. But Facebook back then kind of thought our domestic laws are kind of quaint and cute and did nothing. If in 2008 we had the teeth and the power to hold Facebook accountable, we would never have had the monkey wrenching that went on with Brexit. So I guess my, I, I really like this idea of the uh, coalition of the willing, but I know that in Canada, we're between the UK and we're between the United States. You guys will use trade law against us if we stand up to take on Google or Facebook, take on these platforms, because it's not about consumers, it's about the, the interference with democratic rights, citizen rights. And so we have tools to do this, but we know that it'll be subject to trade uh, attacks if we don't have the United States on side. So I'd like to get your thoughts on how we can start well, to rephrase this wait, whole let's conversation. Let's pause and take the second question, so we'll let Senator Warner wrap up, because I'm sure he's had a very long day. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Bernardo. I'm a uh, parliamentary advisor for Congressman Malone. Um, my question is, since you joked about uh, being tax savvy circa 2001, I'm not sure if you're caught up with the technology, but I just wanted to take uh, know your take, if you have one, on blockchain technology, since we're talking about, you mentioned quantum computing, uh, AI, uh, but you didn't mention that word. And I think when it comes to pri privacy and and also this information, uh, if you think that if you're a techno optimist or a techno pessimist or a techno realist uh, about it and its impacts, um, I think blockchain distributed ledger has great opportunity. I worry when um, we think that we would allow a platform like Facebook that's not shown huge amounts of responsibility as well to become the market leader with Libra and somehow say, all right, we're going to allow this as an open platform, but if you're a Facebook user, you're going to only, you know, you're going to only be able to have a Libra access. So I would rather go slow, particularly when we're talking about kind of the underpinnings of what, what could be the whole financial network on a global basis. Um, so I am you know, excited about blockchain. I'm excited about its potential. I think a little bit it was, um, if, if we watch the market around it, it, it may have been so far oversold and under-delivered. But the notion of a secure distributed um, network, I think it has huge ramifications. But I would rather start slow than give a already dominant power the ability to completely disrupt our financial system. 
and the question, and, and I say this is, um, my mother's family is all from Ontario and Barry and stuff. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was insulting when this administration used Section 232 trade authority to somehow imply that Canada was a national security risk. And I think the damage it did you know, in terms of you know, the closest relationship any two countries have in the world, Canadians had a right to be angry as hell. Uh, and I, I fear that from this administration of this kind of stick approach on everything, I fear it on the notion of, you know, I, where I think there is a real challenge right now. You know, I do think Huawei is a national security risk. Software design system, it's not because there's a backdoor today, but because at any moment in time when you're sending literally thousands of upgrades on a daily basis, there's no way you can screen out all the vulnerabilities that may occur, occur at, at some point in time. But the the ability for us to kind of think about what should be a western back solution you know has to be western back the notion is Huawei's going to get four, 35 to 50% of the market no matter what because they will have China and they will have some of the countries they've already got you combine that with a 100 billion dollar backstop that allows Huawei to price at levels that no other no other country can compete with and if you then think about the amount of R&D dollars that will be generated by owning half the market of the world, you got a real problem. We may be confronting, and Huawei, may, and Huawei and 5G may be the first of a series of examples of, that could be duplicated in AI and, and quantum and a series, take the China 2025 document, where the traditional market-based solution does not work because if China has a national champion that they're – that whether they acquired the technology by theft or development and is good and well-priced, how does any market compete against that? That we may need a fresh look at what, you know, has become a bad word for the most part in the West, but some variation on industrial policy mm-hmm. where we have to find, and I would argue it should not be, and it would, it would be against America's interest if it was simply viewed in that prism of America versus China, American company versus Chinese company. I think we need to have a coalition of the willing Western-backed technology enterprises that are reflective of the values of freedom and democracy and the values we all share versus, again, uh, you know, unfortunately, a, a Chinese company where don't even – if the Chinese leadership is well-intentioned – Look at the laws that have, the legal changes that have been made in China in 2016, where by law, every company in China, their top priority is not to their shareholders, but their number one responsibility is to the Communist Party of China. That is a completely different model. And unless whether we, you know, and unless we can kind of build this broad based coalition, and it will probably take, again, this coalition of the willing, willing to not only kind of pool technology, but sometimes even pool resources, uh, then I don't know how we're going to be successful. The Soviet Union never posed this kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. It was a military challenge and an ideological challenge. It was not an economic challenge where a country like China has both the, the economic heft, the willingness to invest, and the ability to choose national champions that I think our traditional market based solution. Um, may not be able to compete with. And we cannot do this without, even well beyond the five eyes, and even well beyond NATO. I think this needs to be you know, amongst democracies around the world. On that note, so, thank you so all very Mark, much. Mark, uh, you, you set up our second panel perfectly, but you yourself, after this historic and exhausting day, have just amazed us. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Um, we've obviously run over time, but, uh, uh, and there is a reception that follows, but I hope you will stick for what will be a, a great panel. And uh, here they come. I'm supposed to stay here, right, Nina? Yeah, yeah I'm supposed to stay here. Okay, just wondering. <sighs> 
Well, I asked if you wanted to escape from the rest of the day, and I think we have all um, just enjoyed an amazing uh, presentation by uh, uh, a very unusual uh, member of, uh, of Congress, a really well-informed and thoughtful member. So um, uh, I want to thank Senator Warner for his uh, thoughtful remarks. If only the Senate had more people like him, uh -huh. we might get to see proposals, uh, his proposals or good proposals become policy uh, before too long. Uh, but now it's my pleasure to introduce a diverse panel, uh, and I will mention who they are. And I'm already tipping you off. My first question, which is not on this list, Nina, is uh, a few comments on what Mark Warner just said. Uh, sure. I'd like each of you to be able to do that. So right here, Damian Collins from the UK has served as a Tory MP since 2010. He chaired the Committee for Digital Culture, Media, and Sport, founded the UK Subcommittee on Disinformation, and led its inquiry on disinformation and fake news, as well as the International Grand Committee on Disinformation and Fake News. Um, and in your spare time, you do what? Uh, he was also involved in the public seizure and release of internal Facebook emails that detailed how Facebook allowed certain lucrative partners to access user data. Um, Congresswoman, here she is, uh, Nanima uh, Muchu of France was elected to the National Assembly in 2017 on uh, the Macron uh, en marche uh, ticket. She serves on the Assembly's Law Commission, where she is the rapporteur on the country's fake news law. Congressman Alessandro uh, Moulon uh, has served his third term, is serving his third term as representative in Brazil's Chamber of Deputies, where he is leader of the opposition. He was the rapporteur of the Marco Civil uh, da Internet, the country's internet I'm sure I pronounced that, I messed that up, but the country's internet governance law, which ensures net neutrality, privacy protection, and online freedom of expression. Uh, Molon is also an alternate member of the Parliamentary Commission on Disinformation. He has been a member of the International Grand Committee on Disinformation and Fake News. Nathaniel, oh, you're going to have an, an interesting time on this panel. <laughs> Nathaniel Gleischer is head of security policy at Facebook. He has prosecuted cybercrime at the U.S. Department of Justice, served as director for cybersecurity policy at the National Security Council, and was previously the head of cybersecurity strategy at Illumio, a cloud computing security company. And finally, big boss Nina Jankowicz is the Wilson Center's disinformation fellow. Her book, how to Lose the Information War will be published this year. Nina has previously advised Ukraine on strategic communications through the Fulbright Clinton Public Policy Fellowship. Pretty darn impressive. So um, I do want to ask a few questions, but I think because Mark Warner was so inspiring, we ought to go right down the line and give you just a minute or so to make any comments you would like on what he said. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with a lot of what, what uh, Mark Warner said. I think he's... Absolutely right to say what you call here the sort of section section 230 uh, immunity that platforms, ha uh, social media platforms have. I I agree with him. I think that needs to end. Um, in the UK, we've looked at that in terms of creating a legal liability for social media companies for harmful content uh, that they should act against, and that that should be overseen by an independent regulator. That's something I want to see legislated for in the UK. So I think that's a a very important reform. I think some of these issues are so important and so fundamental, and these technologies touch so many aspects of all our lives. We cannot just leave it to the tech companies to police this for themselves. There should be some rights that can be enforced through law. So I think uh, that was a that's a very important aspect to, of what he spoke about. Um, I mean, I could comment on a huge amount of what he said, but we probably haven't got time. Well, why doesn't each of you pick one thing that he said that you think, and you just did, uh, that you think was especially noteworthy that you agreed or disagreed with? Okay. Let's go. I, I totally agree with everything Mark told us. I'm very surprised, and France is very surprised by the American position, really. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, we don't understand, or we understand that it's a strategic or political uh, position. We, we really need the US to be with us. Uh, to find against the fake news. So we will continue the dialogue and uh, we hope that uh, in uh, the next months we will uh, be able to 
to have a, a new system. And uh, we can help if you want, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Congressman uh, Malone. I'd also underline the same uh, worry uh, about uh, the immunity of platforms. Mm -hmm. I think the time of, as, as Senator uh, Warner said, the time of uh, the less of, of less affair in the internet, I think, has to to come to an end because internet nowadays has been used to threaten our democracies. So platforms must have responsibilities also and work with us to protect our future. Thank you. Mr. Gleischer. Uh, I actually agree with just about everything that Senator Warner said as well. Um, two points that I think are useful. One, on regulation. I completely agree. So we've actually called for regulation in four areas around privacy, election integrity, data portability, and harmful content. And I think the balance on how to tackle this is incredibly hard. One thing that I would note about Section 230, so an important part of what my team does is we investigate and look for networks of pages, groups, and accounts that are being deceptive, that are misleading people. We've been sued by a number of people who were behind some of these networks, including some actors from Russia, for taking them down. And so there's another side to this, which I think is difficult to balance. I think there's a really hard debate to be had about Section 230 and where the line is, but I do think we see it as in important ways as a shield that allows us to take action on harmful content and bad behavior as well. I, yeah. I think the most important thing that Senator Warner said was about international standards. Right now, we're at a bowling alley that has no bumpers at it, and we're not particularly good at bowling at the moment. <laughs> um, and we need to set those bumpers, because even if you, you go, you know, uh, Facebook has its own set of terms. If we have our colleagues from Twitter uh, or other platforms in the room, everybody's referring to these phenomenon differently. Um, and we're not speaking the same language, and certainly Congress is not speaking that same language either, and that's one of the goals of, of why we've brought these legislators from around the world here today. So I think uh, setting, setting those standards is, is a key, important goal as we move forward in regulation. Absolutely. You remind me that there was a book written at Harvard called Bowling Alone, uh -huh. and it was about loneliness, but it could also <laughs> refer to this. So uh, question, picking up on what Nina just said to you, Damien, and that is uh, to describe, for those who might not know, know it well, uh, the work of the International Grand Committee and, and how is it working to create an international framework? And aren't we better off to have one rather than to have states like my home state of California regulate in the absence of national U.S. regulation? Um, well, so there, there, there are two aspects of this, I think. International cooperation is incredibly important uh, because we can learn a lot from our different experiences. Uh, different countries have looked at legislating in different ways around harmful content, disinformation, and election integrity. Um, when you're dealing with global businesses as well, it's useful to get insights about working with those businesses in different jurisdictions. And I think the ability for us to, to share information about that has been incredibly helpful too. But at the same time, I think sometimes when, we, you know, when, when people say, well, there should, be, there should be global standards, global policies on tax or data privacy, whatever it is, some of the people that call for that um, are people that basically see that as a way of delaying anything ever happening. You know, because we, we, in terms of global standards, we know we're not going to get China and America in the same place. You know, um, you know Europe and America, Europe and America, and I include the UK in the European description there. Um, you know, are are in very different places on certain things and for very different reasons. But I think what we can do is work together as you know legislators, policymakers, and you know, academics, and people in the academic community as well, to look at the common challenges, the common problems we face about the impact of you know orchestrated disinformation campaigns on. Uh, on democracy, you know, uh, the the central role social media plays as the principal channel through which people engage with their community and receive information and the ability of that to be gamed externally by actors, the importance of algorithms in driving people towards content uh, and whether that is that power is exercised responsibly or not. These are really these are becoming really fundamental questions for society and I think we're in a much stronger position if we collaborate on looking for answers to those problems. Well does the International Grand Committee deal with some of this? Well it, indeed it does. I mean we these are all issues that we've I mean Char Charlie Angus from from Canada is here, my colleague from the UK, uh, Joe Stevens who who served on, on that committee uh, you know, we had representation from around the world. It was interesting to look at the, to learn from the experience.
experiences of France with on, on rules on disinformation. You know, from Brazil, Alessandro, who's on the committee as well. Um, you know, from uh, from Germany um, as well as uh, people from the U.S. as well. So we were able to discuss steps we were taking in our separate jurisdictions to confront some of these problems and sign up to a statement of principles as well, which 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 aim to provide a route map uh, for the way ahead. But I think at the, the core of it is, I think, you know, transparency around communications and information to, to support election integrity, you know, effective action against coordinated efforts, particularly from foreign state actors, and, and proper independent oversight and regulation of these standards, which means independent regulation out, you know, of the tech companies, not by themselves, you know, but done by independent statutory bodies. I think those have all been core to the things that we've discussed. So, thank you. Uh, Nina, legislation also has pitfalls. Uh, why don't you tell us about a few of those? Yeah, sure. So I think there, there are a few things we want to avoid, um, and this is coming from experience and, and research that I've done, mostly in Eastern Europe. I think we've learned that banning things does not work, although that does seem to be our inclination. We just like we like to play whack a troll. Uh, it's an interesting inclination, but we should not uh, we should not give in to it because uh, it usually doesn't have the desired effect. Um, for instance, Ukraine uh, banned a couple of social media networks that were mostly Russian that spread a lot of propaganda. Actually, uh, it didn't keep people off of those platforms. Forms, and uh, people are just now very savvy about using VPNs in Ukraine. Um, and in fact, in, in some ways, it amplifies them uh, to some extent. So that's something we need to keep in mind. There's also been um, an inclination to create sort of politicized non-expert bodies in order to be kind of the regulatory mechanisms on this sort of thing. And I think that's also an inclination that we should avoid. We need to have people who understand these issues uh, working on them. And we also need to m ensure that they're not falling into the wrong hands if a government is, or administration changes. Um, the third thing, and, and Senator Warner mentioned this, um, and this is true across my research, is that Governments that don't recognize that they have a domestic disinformation problem are really <laughs> unable to solve the regulatory issues related to foreign disinformation. Um, and so we, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the International Grand Committee is doing this work about principles. Um, I think that's something, again, another reason that why, why we're here this week. Um, we need to all sign up to those principles, and we haven't done enough of that in the United States. Um, and until we sign up to them, I really don't think that we can pass that legislation. I don't know how we can, in good faith, uh, put rules of the road down on paper when we're not willing to adhere yeah. to them ourselves. So how do you handicap the, the likelihood that we would sign up to them in the near future? Not very well. Uh, I don't. I don't have hopes. Certainly, before this Congress is over, um, and it very a lot depends on the n outcome of the next election. Okay, <laughs> Naima. Sorry for that. France's uh, fake news law held up to fierce debate in the National Assembly. Uh, what were the main disagreements, and how were they overcome? Yes. Part of the law was controversial, yet it's the result of, of a very long and concerted effort. I uh, took part in hearings, meetings and talks about the bill for over a year while uh, never losing sight of uh, my main goal. I aimed to legislate in a manner uh, that would preserve the freedom of expression, of course, which is guaranteed by our constitution, and uh, at the same time ensuring citizens to have to access to information they can trust. Uh, anyway, you have to know that criticism of the bill was somewhat surprising because um, some of our political opponents felt it was too dangerous and that it went too far, and others thought it was pointless. Uh, I believed and we believed with my colleagues that there was surely a middle road and uh, a voice of reason. The main line of criticism was that the law and in particular, the powers given to the judge would destroy civil liberties mm -hmm. and would censure information and create uh, a form of a thought police, mm. as if the judge would, as, would act as a censor in the detriment of the, the journalists. Of course, it was wrong and it was unfounded. We, we really put in place a very precise and very balanced uh, system. We. Mm. And I, I say that with the, the utmost conviction because I have been working for nine years as a lawyer at the Paris Bar, specializing in press law. I used to defend a lot of journalists, and I know uh, what they do uh, in, the, in the public uh, interest. 
there has been a significant shift in the parliamentary debate. At first, my opponent uh, um, colleagues did not even believe that there was an issue vis-à-vis -vis fake news. They acknowledged the, existent, uh, the existence of uh, false information, but they felt that it was not a problem requiring the, inter the intervention of the legislature. Then, through the, um, what we called uh, in France the shuttle, the discussions between the two houses of the parliament, so, and it takes uh, several months, then the minds gradually change, and uh, my colleagues say yes, Finally, fake news is a main issue in uh, our society. Well, and if I respond, yeah. Well, you did respond, and congratulations mm -hmm. to you and uh, your president and your country for grappling with something and and getting to a solution. Thank you very much. Which our country it was not easy, really. Doing but we did. Yet. So, Nathaniel, aren't yes. you lucky to be on this panel? <laughs> Uh, representatives from around the world have joined us for this week's disinformation events. What is Facebook doing to ensure that its community standards are upheld outside the United States, particularly in non-English speaking countries where the cultural and political context might be different for outside observers uh, to parse? Uh, thanks for the question. So a couple of things. Um, the first is, I think, almost 90% of our users are from outside the United States. So making sure that we're enforcing our community standards globally and consistently is particularly important. We have 35,000 people working on safety and security at this point at the company, which includes more than 15,000 content reviewers that review content and analyze content in more than 50 languages. So that covers the vast majority of speakers on our platform around the world. Uh, we also have automated systems that detect and block millions of fake accounts every day, most of them within minutes of creation. And the last thing is we work really closely with partners around the world, whether they're civil society organizations or governments. Understanding local context is extremely important when you're talking about something like, for example, hate speech, where you can find particular terms that in one country, or honestly, even within one region of one country, have a very specific and very harmful meaning that they might not have anywhere else. And so we build, particularly around elections, so we have now worked uh, since 2016 on, I think, more than 200 elections around the world to do our part to protect them. And um, we have rapid response centers that engage when an election is coming up or when there is another critical social moment where you might see a spike in this type of problematic content. Uh, and one of the things that we've been able to do is identify in certain cases, for example, a spike in speech that wouldn't normally be considered hate speech. But within a particular context, in a particular region, it would qualify so that we can respond very quickly. And the last thing that I'd offer that maybe helps frame a little bit the conversation, one of the things that we try to think about very distinctly is to separate out content and behavior. So we're talking here about disinformation. Uh, Senator Warner made a really important point, which is when we look, for example, at the content shared by Russian operations, a lot of it, maybe even the majority of it, isn't in fact provably false. A lot of what is happening here is about false information, but a lot of it actually isn't. It's about concealed identity or it's about false amplification, which is something right. else that Senator right. Warner talked about. He did. And so when we are investigating and enforcing, we have our community standards that are public in a whole number of languages around the world, and they lay out types of content that are impermissible, whether it's hate speech or threats or other types of content, but also behaviors. So for example, the scaled use of fake accounts to pretend to be someone you're not. Every year, we have a team of investigators that look for these networks of disinformation. We found 50 of them last year. Each one we publicized, put out a public analysis of it, and worked with third-party independent groups to analyze it. All of those, that investigation isn't based on the content. It's based on the behavior. It's based on the patterns they're engaging with. And that's important in countries around the world where you see local context. And it's also important because these actors engage with really sensitive political topics within countries. And if we're making decisions based on the content, immediately people will anticipate or perceive bias in every action. And so being able to say, when we do these enforcements, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you said. What matters is you're engaging in deceptive behavior that is misleading our users. That, that piece is very important to deal with working around the world.
Well, you mentioned the other thing he said about amplification. I thought that was fascinating. He said people have a right to say crazy, stupid stuff, but they don't have a right to amplify it. Mm. Do you Mm. agree with that? So one of the things that we do, for example, if a piece of content on our platform is rated false by a fact checker. So we have a network of, uh, I think it's 44 third-party fact checkers that review and rate content as false. If they determine that a piece of content is false, we downrank it. And it drastically reduces the distribution. And so it sort of follows what Senator Warner was in fact talking about. You can say this and it can be out there, but we reduce the distribution so you don't get to amplify it. And one of the reasons we do that is we don't just downrank it, we also label it. And you very clearly label it. In fact, for videos, there's a a filter over the video that says false with a link to the review. And one of the reasons for that is there are two types of people who might find misinformation, whether it's a video or otherwise. First is someone who might stumble across it. You don't want people to stumble across misinformation, and that's why we downrank it. Second is people who look for it, who seek it out. If we remove it, for example, those people will probably find it elsewhere because, as Nina was talking about, banning things doesn't make them disappear. They will hunt for it. But because there's a label on it, when they find it, there is a very clear label saying it's false. So maybe there's an opportunity for education. There. What about, there's a th- also an important third category, which is people that are targeted with information because mm-hmm. they receive, because they're messaged through f- very large Facebook groups or they're targeted for pages or, in- or intermediaries are paid to boost content and promote content across the platform yeah. outside of Facebook's ad tools. Right. And those are probably the more common ways in which people would, 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 would come across that material because it's being pushed at them. So what we've seen in terms of influence operations is actually the majority of it leverages organic engagement, uh, not paid engagement. Um, we are seeing actors more and more start to pivot to using groups. I think, particularly, I might be wrong, but I think what Damien was trying to get at is, a, is off-platform payment, so kind of an under-the-table deal for, can you distribute this content for me? Yeah, as a, exactly, there's yeah. that. but there's also group, groups as well. And yes, I, yes. And, and I, think that, I think groups have always been important, and I think you know, in my, in my engagement with Facebook, I, I remember being told once that the only way of driving content through the platform is through paid advertising through Facebook pages. And I think, you know, but you look at these very large networks of groups that can boost content to hundreds of thousands of people. And some of the disinformation studies in Europe looking, uh, yeah. you know, and some of the things Senator Warner touched on as well, where groups that are set up to harmlessly talk about, you know, soccer or other things suddenly starting you know, pushing uh, a great scale um, political content or maybe yeah. disinformation as well. And that, and that for, me, for me, people that come across this, I think it's more likely they'd see it in that way than it would be they've, they've searched for it or they've right. stumbled across it. Alabama football. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's take a few audience questions. We, we have... We, have we gone to Congressman Malone yet? I did. Did we? Yes. Oh, well, I, I asked him a question. I asked you a question. In the first, in the the first, first round. Yes. Well, Just are some, we in the second round? Ra- um, uh, would you like to say something else? <laughs> I, I, I thought I asked you a question, and I thought what I had planned to do sort of was ask everybody about uh, the Warner speech, then ask everyone a specific question, which I did ask you. N- not Congressman Malone yet. Not a second time. I didn't second time. It's okay. I thought I did. Okay, well, <laughs> Joe's... <laughs> This is what happens when... I just want to make... Brazil's got I very interesting I said, experience that I want to make oh, sure we hear, hear about. Oh, no. I didn't ask you. Excuse <laughs> me. My fault. Thank you. No Thank problem. You, Nina. That's, That's okay. why she's the big boss. So, my question is, your party is now in the opposition in Brazil's legislature. Has that changed your approach to these issues? And is there any optimism that you can find consensus in responding to disinformation in Brazil? Actually, it's not a matter of My being... My apologies. No, no problem. Uh, actually, it's not a uh, matter of being in opposition. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, I was in opposition to the former government uh, in 2017 and 2018, but the former government uh, didn't weaponize false information as the current one does. Okay. So it depends of, on the kind of the government and the use of the false information mm-hmm. that it does. Uh, but that's a huge problem in Brazil no- nowadays. Uh, this information was a very important weapon in last elections, mm-hmm. and it was uh, very important to, to, the, to the results. So that's really a big threat to democracy, as right. we saw in Brazil, and about right. optimism. Uh, I am optimistic because of, uh, I see... I can see a, a possibility of consensus in Congress, mm-hmm. not between Congress and government. 
I I can explain that because the 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 actual the actual government doesn't have much support in Congress, and mm. it's it is attacking Congress a lot. So Congress is uh, kind of realizing that's important to uh, fight against misinformation and and disinformation yeah. to protect institutions against government. So that's why I think uh, w we're going to be able to build a consensus in Congress, in spite of the fact that the government is not going to participate on that. Well, I wish the same for our Congress. Uh, good luck to you. <laughs> and I apologize again for somehow missing you. All right, a few questions. We have about 10 plus minutes. A woman in the middle in the back, and then a woman way over on the right side in the back. And we have a microphone. Please identify yourself and ask a short question. Hi, Kate Boffman. Uh, I'm here from Inner News. I was wondering, we talked a little bit about um, the role of private companies and the government in combating disinformation. What is the role of local media, not necessarily in the United States, but around the world, um, and also potentially uh, local NGOs and other organizations in combating disinformation? Uh, are you identifying a particular person to ask that question to? Because I, I think we're going to skip all, me, uh, all of them answering. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Uh, do you want me to answer it now, or do you want to take a round? Um, well, why don't we take two? Okay. Well, no, because the other one might not be targeted to you. So okay, great. Guess. Well, I, I always refer to local media as the connective tissue between people and their governments. And I'm sure um, a lot of the Americans in the room are familiar with the fact that we have very, very few accredited reporters to the Capitol for each state now. I think it's under uh, under 30, if not 20, um, from, from each state. Uh, and, you know, I grew up in New Jersey. My parents used to get the local paper delivered to us because God God forbid Americans walk anywhere or drive somewhere to get something. So it came to our driveway every morning. And as I grew up, it got thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, and eventually they stopped subscribing to it. Uh, and we would just get the New York Times on Sundays. And of course, they still consumed news. And that's not a problem when you live in a big metropolitan area. I mean, New York was uh, one hour away, Philadelphia one hour away. But if you're in Iowa or Kansas or North Dakota or someplace where you don't have that local uh, lens on what's going on in the rest of the country, I think you search out other sources of information. Um, and that's why we're seeing that gap filled with uh, information that is not necessarily trustworthy. Um, in terms of local NGOs, I, I normally talk a lot about media literacy and um, civics and digital literacy. I think that is where local NGOs can play a huge part. Uh, I think that message is much more trusted coming from a community organizer than it is coming from uh, even local government. Um, I'd also like to put libraries on the table as a vector for that type of training. Um, a lot of the polling shows that libraries are still very uh, highly trusted in the United States, one of the highest trusted institutions. The rest of us aren't doing so well. Um, and they're searching for kind of their renaissance in the digital era. So this is something um, that I know a lot of librarians are excited about and something I think we should be uh, pursuing more as well. Well, the oldies in this room in, in America might remember Walter Cronkite, mm. who would deliver the news every night and say, and that's the way it is. <laughs> and everybody believed him. And we don't have any of those people anymore, I don't think anywhere. Uh, question in the back of the room, um, pink sweater, yeah. Hi, my name is Shereen. I am the founder of an organization called Stop Online Violence Against Women. And my question is actually about the way in which we're, you're talking about hate speech and, the, and targeting aspects in terms of disinformation and in terms of disinformation in politics and what is now has become digital vote suppression. And this is for Nathaniel. Um, we've been tracking targeting black women online since 2013. Um, we are now fast forward and found out that in Facebook, the IRA accounts targeted the black community overwhelmingly to uh, interfere in our election because the black vote is important. We now actually have tracked five campaigns that are targeting black voters. What are you doing to handle that? And also the other piece is when you talk about hate speech, um, on your platform, you can find the N-word in so many forms and fashions, um, but there are plenty of people who speak up about race and issues who are, happen to be black or brown, and they will be removed for saying white people. Um, how do you discern the differences between what, what is really hate speech and actually a conversation in this, in this regard? 
And Nina, if you want to chime in after that, feel I'll free. Let, I'll let Nathaniel take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good, easy question, so thank you. Um, so I think a couple of things. First, the texture of what is and isn't hate speech is an incredibly difficult line to draw. There's a reason that we do a couple of things. First, as I said, we have our community standards published where we detail where those lines are. The problem is drawing a line like that statically on paper is never going to capture all the range of inputs and challenges that would go into it. So we have uh, teams internally that think about how to look at the circumstances. Is someone being targeted? Is an individual or a group being targeted? How is the word being used? There's also a history of words that were hate speech that have been reclaimed by the community that was targeted by them and using them in positive fashions, right? We also then have an appeals process because the truth is we're going to make mistakes. And I think we need to have a pretty rapid appeals process so that if we make a mistake removing a piece of content, then we can address that and put it back up. So there's a, we need a combination of clear rules. We need uh, teams from around the world who can think about the context and respond, and then an appeals process to address it. And part of why we're building, and we've talked recently about the oversight board, the, edit, the, out, the external board that is going to review certain decisions that we make and help review them independently, is indeed to make that appeals process more reliable and more structured. The other thing that you asked about was targeting of African-American communities and black communities. And what I would say is we've definitely seen Russian actors target black communities. We've seen them target a whole range of communities. And they look for, they look for opportunities where they can drive a wedge or find people. And you said uh, digital voter suppression. So one of the things that we have is we have a pretty clear policy now. Anyone who is sharing content that uh, lies about where, when, or how to vote, for example, that is one of the pieces of content that we will remove. Because the consequences of tricking someone into not being able to vote for an election are so enduring and so long-standing that we need to take that immediate action. More broadly, we mentioned, and I mentioned, working with civil society groups, working with civil liberties groups, working with organizations in the communities that might see trends in threats early is something that has been incredibly valuable for us and has helped us find these patterns and take action on them. If you're seeing particular patterns you think it would be useful, I would be more than happy to talk more about that afterwards. We have a team of investigators that looks into these exact type of operations, and I'd be happy to work on that with you if that's helpful. Okay, let's... So, can I, can I, can I, sure, and I was going to ask the two more questions be directed to our international panelists and, and not to our Americans. Um, um, but if you did, you well, want to comment? I wanted to on comment this? on that yeah. specifically as well because I'm I'm sort of I'd be fascinated to find out more about, about about the work you're doing, and I'm guessing as well that the sort of voter suppression is not work that you're you've identified is not just around misleading people of when votes are being cast, but it's more it's more sinister than that. And for me, I think there's we need a real debate about the way certainly for advertising tools are used in political campaigns on, on social media, and whether actually micro targeting is used to, to actually aid things like voter suppression. I, I, would, I thought it was a very positive step that YouTube have are now not allowing customer match to be used for, to target political advertising. I don't think Facebook should use, I think Facebook should remove lookalike audiences from uh, data targeting in their campaigns as well, which would make this sort of stuff harder. I think political targeting political ads should be based on much more generic information like, you know, um, like your location, uh, maybe, maybe your age, but not you know, detailed data yeah. sort of about your religious beliefs, you know, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and so on. I don't, I think this is being exploited and causing a lot of harm. Thank you. Okay, there's a question on the end here, uh, right there, and we'll take a question from this side. We'll, for our international panelists, yes. please. Uh, exactly. And one more question over here, anybody? If not, we'll take the, the, the question over there. Okay, so we'll okay. bundle these together. Okay. Uh, Jill Doherty from the Wilson Center and also oh, hi, from Jill. Georgetown. <laughs> I can barely see you. Yes. Hello. Uh, and uh, Georgetown University as well. Um, I, a question, actually, I was thinking of um, Damien Collins and also Naima Muchu. Um, the, the question is, the Russians um, support what they call a sovereign internet. And uh, the Chinese, you could say, of course, have the Great Wall, the Firewall as well. So there's, there's a, a kind of an uber approach to um, regulation. What you're talking about in the West is now a type of you know, growing need for or push for regulation. Is there a bright line between those? 
Or is there a danger that one could bleed over, well, actually the West bleed over into the more controlled world? Um, and then is there a chance maybe that the Russians and the Chinese should be brought into this discussion, even if they seem to have a pretty diametrically opposed view? I hope you understand the question. Thank you. And we'll take the final question over here. Uh, thank you, Stuart MacDonald, member of the UK Parliament. Uh, thanks for having uh, us here this, this week, Nina. I just wonder what the panel's view is on the death of Facebook. Uh, I became a, a parliamentarian five years ago, and if you, were, if you were to stand for election and ask me my advice, the first piece of advice I would give you would be don't open a Facebook page or a Twitter account because it has just, it, it has mushed a lot of people's minds, my own included, to the point I don't use Facebook from a personal perspective. I have a political page that broadcasts stuff very localised, but I just don't use it. Um, and I just wonder if, does the panel think there will come a point where people just give up on it and go back to the library uh, and read books uh, again? Or is it here forever? Okay, uh, why don't we have the three of you, each of you, answer those two questions. And then if Nina or Nathaniel is dying to say something, you will. But otherwise, <laughs> we're standing between you and the reception. So why don't we start with Alessandro, since I passed you over the last time. <laughs> no, My no apologies problem. again. Uh, in fact, I would, I would like to, to answer the, the second one, okay. maybe. Okay. Uh, we see uh, we we've been talking in the in the panels about uh, for instance twitter and how twitter uh, influences elections in brazil uh, our problems more than twitter or facebook has been whatsapp whatsapp uh, it's very popular in brazil uh, more than 100 million people uh, use uh, use uh, whatsapp in brazil we have to 220 million people. So you can imagine it's half or, or even nowadays more than half that people uh, are using WhatsApp and it's very difficult to follow uh, back who started with uh, fake news and disinformation in WhatsApp. And I think uh, in Brazil we have been uh, uh, discovering that it's even more... Uh, trustable information people receive from WhatsApp because they, they receive from their aunts and grandmas and, and, and cousins. So it's, it seems something very familiar. And since you are receiving uh, some information from, from a, a relative of you, uh, it's very difficult to, to question if, if that's true or not. So it was our biggest problem in last elections it was WhatsApp, and that puts a lot of change, challenges uh, in more uh, uh, f in face to Facebook or, or to Twitter because uh, it's encrypted and it's person to person, so you, you don't have the the chain, the, the 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 history of the of the message. So it's a I think it's even a, a bigger challenge than than Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter and. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to, to legislate about that. I think there's no easy solution in legislation. I know uh, that also in terms of technology, it's not easy to, 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 to solve that, but we must do it because that, that's threatening our, our countries and, and democracy and, our, and even health of people. So that's our experiences. Uh, is very, very uh, difficult with WhatsApp nowadays. Thank you. Naima, can you a also answer the yes. first question, um, Jill's question? I have no problem to debate with uh, Russia today or, or Sputnik. I would have preferred to dialogue with the Russian uh, for the constriction of the law, of course. But since they are in a political strategy, it's impossible. It's clearly impossible. Uh, so it was easier for us to draft, draft a law by hearing all the experts, and there were Russian experts, for instance, too. Uh, it was easier that way. We will see 
if uh, Russian come to the table to discuss, but for the moment, it's really impossible for us. Okay, Damien. Um, thank you. Just briefly on, I think for the international perspective, I think what we're trying to champion is that, that we don't want a world which is either a surveillance capitalism society through technology or a surveillance state model through technology, but a system where citizens have some sort of rights about how their data and information is used, the quality of the information they receive, uh, and that those rights can be protected and defended and the ability to harness some of the data trail that they create to do things that they want to do. I think this technologies, these technologies can do a huge amount of good, um, but on the whole, they're largely used to make, you know, really just to make money through ads, you know, um, and, and, and I think, uh, so I think there's a lot more we could do, and I think that's what we're trying to stand up and fight for, is, is a world where actually citizens feel more empowered uh, by this, and I think, you know, Stuart's question is right, and there is a real danger that um, across different social media platforms now, there's a general coarsening of the way people speak to each other, rather than this being an opportunity to create a broad, pluralistic society where everyone has a voice in the great global conversation, it's created largely a series of autocracies, you know, where people are in one bubble or another and they, they're expected to conform within it, not to express divergent opinions. And my slight concern would be that rather than these technologies, you know, amplifying people's, you know, personal opinions in a good way, when they're, they've got ideas they want to share, that ideas are stamped on and suppressed if they don't comply with what other people think, or they, they're never amplified effectively because they, that requires some artificial mechanism that most individuals don't don't have. So there's a huge opportunity, I think, to get this right, but there are, there's a lot that we have to fight to, you know, there's a lot that's wrong that we need to put right, um, and um, otherwise I think, you know, the, I, I worry about the, the border impact it'll have. I, I don't share Stuart's uh, belief that it, people will just turn off. I think people will be left in a position where they can't they can't opt out, uh, but but they're left in a world they don't want to be in. Well, on a on a fairly somber, serious day in Washington, historic day. I, I I'd love to end with the last that last comment about there's a huge opportunity to get it right, and thank Nina in in particular, but this extraordinary panel and Mark Warner for at least educating me, uh, a, a fairly analog um, un, you know, person, or at least uh, a digital adapter, not a digital native. Uh, about these hard issues, and we'll have to find a way forward. That's why we're having this workshop for the rest of the week uh, mm -hmm. to see if there are some common answers to very, very tough problems. So, again, thank you, audience, for coming and staying late. This is what we expect at the Wilson Center. You're all serious and you want to learn. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of my uh, colleagues here, uh, it really means a lot to us that you show up and you ask good questions. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.